Thank you for taking the time to watch this educational video regarding a sexually violent predator that has moved into our community. We won't take much of your time, but we want to make sure you have all of the information so you can make important decisions for you and your family. I'm Kate Porras. Throughout this video, you'll hear from several members of our local law enforcement community as we discuss why we're doing this community notification, how sex offenders are managed, as well as safety suggestions. At the end, we'll give you information about the specific individual that is the subject of this community notification. In the mid-90s, the federal government established several laws which provide the foundation for Colorado laws regarding sex offenders and why you're watching this video. One law required states to establish sex offender registrations for all convicted sex offenders and ways to track them. Another law requires states to find a means of notifying residents and communities where sex offenders live. A third law provides lifetime supervision for some sex offenders as well as a national sex offender registry. In general, these three laws mean sex offenders have a lesser right to privacy and the community and law enforcement have a right to know who they are and where they live so they can keep people safe. In Colorado, there's a difference between a registered sex offender and a sexually violent predator, or SVP. SVP is a classification given to identify the highest risk sex offenders. Every state has ways of identifying highest risk offenders and of separating them from other sex offenders who may not be given that classification. For example, other states use risk level one, two, or three. The classification does not necessarily describe the sexual offense. Colorado identifies SVPs in two ways, depending on if the crime happened in our state or in another state. If the conviction occurred in Colorado, there are four factors that go into determining if someone is classified as an SVP, whether the offender is an adult, the date of the crime and the conviction, the relationship to the victim, and the results of an assessment. If the conviction happened in another state and that state classified the person as a highest risk offender equivalent to Colorado's classification of sexually violent predator, then the offender is given the SVP classification in Colorado. Colorado law states that all SVPs are subject to a community notification when they move to a new address. Community notification begins when the Department of Corrections, Parole, Probation, or another state notifies local law enforcement that the SVPs are arriving in their community. The SVP must register with the local law enforcement agency. That agency then conducts a community notification in accordance with the Colorado Sex Offender Management Board criteria. This video is just one way that local law enforcement conducts those community notifications. At times we may hold community meetings as well, but this isn't your only source of information. You can always stop by any of the local law enforcement agencies for a complete list of all of the registered sex offenders living in each jurisdiction. Those lists include the SVPs. If you want to see where all SVPs and registered sex offenders live in Mesa County, regardless of jurisdiction, visit the website on your screen. We'll show you the address again at the end of the video. The Colorado Bureau of Investigations also places the sexually violent predators on the internet within three days. That site is at sor.state.co.us. Some but not all SVPs are under criminal justice supervision, such as probation or parole. There might not be a cure for sex offenders, but like any behavioral choice, they can learn new behaviors and skills. That means that some of them can be safely managed in the community. When someone's placed on probation, they usually have standard conditions they must abide by. However, a sex offender placed on probation or parole will have additional conditions they must follow. These conditions tend to be pretty intensive, rather lengthy, and some of them include waiving confidentiality, getting treatment specifically related to the crime, and polygraph testing. Waiving confidentiality is important because secrecy really undermines the rehabilitation efforts and threatens public safety. Sex offenders must be completely accountable for their behavior and agree to these intensive and intrusive measures in order to remain under community supervision. Colorado uses a three-pronged approach for managing SVPs. On the top is the criminal justice supervision. This is typically probation or parole. On the bottom left-hand corner is the sex offender specific treatment. This is a therapist involved in court-ordered treatment for the sex offender. And on the bottom right, you'll see a polygraph examiner. All sex offenders, including SVPs, who are under supervision while in the community, are required to undergo polygraph examinations on a regular basis. 
You'll also see to the side community members. That's because we believe that the community can be an integral part of this system by reporting anything suspicious or any wrongdoings to the authorities in an appropriate manner. Locally, you can call 970-242-6707 to report suspicious behavior or call 911 if you feel it's an immediate threat to someone's safety. There are some important things that you should know about all sex offenders, not just SVPs. And there are some misconceptions that may be out there. In Colorado, one in four women and one in 17 men have been sex assault victims in their lifetimes. Some people believe that the majority of sex offenders are placed into prison. However, most of them are not even caught or detected. And that's because more than 80% of sex crimes are never reported to law enforcement. Some people think that they can easily spot a sex offender, but there really is no typical sex offender. However, it is important to remember that they all tend to be deceptive, manipulative, and secretive in the way in which they commit their offenses. Some people also think that sex offenders have long histories of criminal behavior, when in fact many sex offenders have no criminal history at all. Studies show that 75% of offenses are carefully planned. They are not impulsive acts. So with regards to sex offender characteristics, it's important to know that most offenders engage in what we call crossover behavior. That means that although an offender may be caught for one type of offense, this person is often at risk to commit another type of offense. Someone may be convicted of victimizing a person of a certain age, for example, but that does not mean that they will not harm someone of another age or gender. It's true that most sex offenders are male. Female offenders account for less than 10% of offenders. The crime a person was convicted of is only one indicator of risk. Also, sexual deviancy typically begins in mid to late adolescence. And this shouldn't be confused with juveniles who have committed sex offenses in that they don't necessarily become adult sex offenders. However, adults who've committed sex offenses typically began that behavior as teenagers. It's also important to know that sex assaults do not necessarily occur in dangerous places. A study conducted in the Colorado Department of Corrections shows that 85% of sex offenders reported having committed the crime at their own residence or at the victim's residence. In addition, most sex crimes are not committed by strangers. 78 to 90 percent of sex offenses are committed by someone the victim knows. When it comes to sex assault victims, there are also many myths. One is that the victims ask for it. The fact is, sex offenders use power and control to dominate and humiliate victims of both genders. Another myth is that victims who suffer no obvious physical injuries are not seriously traumatized by their experience. That's not true at all. Only about 4% of rape victims sustain serious physical injuries as a result of rape. 70% reported no physical injuries at all. But all victims suffer from the effects of being raped. Victims of sex assault may exhibit many different responses to the trauma, including crying, anger, being quiet or withdrawn. Sex assault by someone known to the victim creates an even more difficult recovery process. Victims often develop post-traumatic stress disorder and long-term effects, including anxiety, eating disorders, flashbacks, divorce, loss of sexual interest, loss of concentration, and sleeping disorders. Victims of sex assault are three times more likely than the general population to suffer from depression and are 13 times more likely to attempt suicide. They also have greatly increased rates of substance use or abuse and a higher rate of unwanted pregnancy. And they have an increased risk of involvement with the judicial system. One of the ways to combat that is to control the response and minimize it which is done when the victims are supported and believed by their families and the members of the community. The community also has a vested interest in helping the offenders be successfully managed within the community. All SVPs and some other sex offenders must register with local law enforcement agencies where they live on a quarterly basis for the rest of their lives. Those convicted of sex crimes against children must also register their email addresses and internet identifiers with the local law enforcement agencies. It's important to remember, though, that sex offenders have the same need for housing and employment as other citizens, and harassing, threats, and intimidation of those offenders is counterproductive to the community management goals. In fact, it may cause offenders to go underground and not even register with law enforcement, making it very difficult to track and manage them. 
Harassment and threats to these people is criminal. They will be investigated, and those doing the harassing will be subject to prosecution. There is no way to protect yourself in all situations, and the following tips and advice cannot completely eliminate the risk of sexual assault. However, they may provide you with information to prepare you and your family for potential situations. Many people are concerned about what to tell their children about the sexually violent predator that has moved into their area. Avoid any scary details. Be honest and use language that is age appropriate. Teach your children not to harass or visit the offender's home or yard and teach them to tell safe adults if anyone acts inappropriately toward them, such as if they're too friendly or threatening or if they're just acting creepy. You should pay close attention to your child's thoughts and feelings. Role play with your child, act out scenarios of various dangerous situations and teach them how to respond. This gives them the ability to recognize such situations and not be surprised by what's happening to them. Teach them to avoid high risk situations and be observant of their surroundings. Teach them to be thoughtful and to use good judgment when choosing their friends and partners. Teach them appropriate social behaviors. Teach them their correct names for body parts and teach them that adults are not always right. You can also teach your children the importance of honesty and the danger of keeping secrets. In just a few moments, you're going to receive information regarding the sexually violent predator that has moved into our community. Remember to view the website to see where all sex offenders live in Mesa County. If you have any questions, contact any of the local law enforcement agencies in Mesa County. And thank you for taking the time to educate yourself about this important topic. Here is some specific information about the subject of this community notification, 46-year-old Mark Gustafson. His birth date is September 8, 1970. He's a white man, 6 feet 5 inches tall, weighing 270 pounds with brown hair and blue eyes. He has five tattoos, a cross with a spider web and flames on his right upper arm, a yin-yang on his right ankle, a heart with a ribbon on his right ankle, a partial skull on his left shoulder blade, and a dragon head on his left upper arm. He's living at 1561 Highway 50 in Grand Junction. His offense related to this mandatory community notification is sex assault on a child in a position of trust, which occurred in Mesa County. His conviction was in 2001. His other conviction in Colorado is indecent exposure to minors and adults out of Delta County, Colorado. Mark Gustafson is supervised by Parole Officer Jim Neely. His phone number is 970-255-9126, extension 4165. There are 287 registered sex offenders in the city limits of Grand Junction and 339 in Mesa County outside of the city limits. The Grand Junction Police Department is available to provide useful information regarding sexual assault and personal safety and to make referrals to other local resources to help those who have been impacted by sexual assault or this notification process. If you have information regarding current criminal activity of this or any other offender, or if you observe this offender engaging in any high risk or inappropriate behavior, please call 911 or contact his supervising officer, Jim Neely. Again, Mr. Neely's phone number is 255-9126, extension 4165. The information provided herein is current and accurate as of this date, but is subject to change. For additional information or educational handouts, contact the Registered Sex Offender Program at 970-549-5234, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m.